our special validatory talk of 20th Astro Astro Olympiad OCSC. Uh, today we have with us Professor H S Mani. Uh, for those who already don't know his name, I I will give a more detailed introduction let later uh, in the second half of the function. But uh, I will just say right now that he has been physics teacher to many of our uh, senior colleagues. He was in IIT Kanpur for many years and then he went to various other institutes. Where presently is in Chennai Mahanal Institute. More about him, I will talk, talk in the second half. Right, right now I will uh, give uh, dice to Professor Mani. Thank you, Aniket, and uh, good morning to everybody. It's uh, very nice to be here. I feel it privileged to be able to attend to such a talented set of people. Now, what I plan to talk about gravitational waves, which I'm sure all of you have heard. It was very sensational news of this century. And so let me start by discussing uh, Einstein. Uh, can you people hear me, or is this working? Or uh, had proposed the general theory of relativity for theory of gravitation. And this was done almost uh, 100 years ago. And one of the basic concepts in general theory of gravitation is the principle of equivalence. And the principle of equivalence in a simple way is as following statement. Supposing there is a uniform gravitational field, there is no experiment that can distinguish a uniform gravitational field from a uniformly accelerated frame. That is, we have gravity here. If I assume the gravity is uniform, and if you are in a lift which is freely falling, whatever experiment you do there, if I analyze it, it will be the same as coming from gravity for my frame. So this is the statement. But on the other hand, there is no uniform gravity. Gravity here is pointing radially down. And similarly, New York, it is pointing radially down. So I have to match all of them properly in terms of various different frames. That is not easy. That requires a certain kind of mathematics, which ultimately leads the space to become curved. The treatment has to be like the surface of a sphere. So let me just go over the slides saying all this. So here it is, theory. One of the basic concepts is the principle of equivalence. Stated simply, it says that there is no experiment which can distinguish between uniform gravitational field and an accelerated frame. The concept of equivalence when extended over a large region, over a region where gravity is not uniform, leads to treating space and time as curved like at the surface of a two-dimensional sphere. Einstein wrote the equation for gravity based on curved space. And it is different from the Maxwell's equations. All of you are familiar with Maxwell's equation. We study them. Gauss's theorem, Biasawat's law with extension of displacement current, and then Faraday's law, and so on. So they are the Maxwell's equations, but they are different. The, but there are also some similarities. Charges produce electric and magnetic field when charges move. Similarly, masses produce gravitational field. This is one similarity. However, Maxwell's equations are linear. If I have two charges and if I write down the field, I will get the addition uh, of the electric field in a linear way. These follow from the Maxwell's equations. Whereas the Einstein's equations, the Einstein's equation is nonlinear. However, there is a way. Gravity is not a very strong force, it's a weak force. So one can make a linear approximation. The effects of gravity can be written in orders of the coupling constant, the Newtonian coupling constant. And the limit of the linear approximation, there are more similarities between electri electromagnetism and gravitation. They look very similar in many ways. One such property is gravitation. There are gravitational waves like electromagnetic waves. When we have charges moving, in, for example, in an antenna, when in a radio station there are charges moving in the current, and they produce magnetic field, electromagnetism. Similarly, if I have masses which are moving, and they will produce a gravitational field. So that similarity comes 
in the linear approximation that one makes. Both travel with the velocity of light. We will denote the velocity of light by C, the standard practice. After an effort lasting over <coughs> five decades, gravitational waves were first observed on 14th of September 2015 and it has been labeled as 15 for the year, 09 for the month and 14 for the day. And this is the standard method by which gravitational detection has been stated. Soon after, one more was discovered on 26 December 2015. Four more were observed in 2017. The last one due to a merger of two neutron stars at a distance of about 100 million light years away. The others are all billion light years away, 10 times more than these distances. So this is the nearest ones which were observed and they were observed not because of black hole merger but because of neutron star merger. An electromagnetic signal was also observed with the last one because it was nearer, the electromagnetic signal was observed simultaneously in 70 observatories in seven different countries. This opens up a two different methods of observing a celestial object, one a gravitational wave, the other the electromagnetic wave. This, there is also a possibility of observing neutrinos, but still that is a long way off. So how are the waves detected? When a gravitational wave passes, it changes the distance between two points. The changes in distances are extremely small. They produce changes in an interference pattern in an interferometer. Let us see this. See, if I have a laser source and a light beam is coming here and there is a beam splitter. Beam splitter splits the beam in one in that direction and one in this direction. And the beam comes back and it goes to the detector and this one comes here and comes to the detector. Here we have a in interference pattern coming because this path length and this path length may not be the same. You firstly adjust them such that these two path lengths differ by lambda by 2, then in that case you will have a dark fringe. On the other hand, if a gravitational wave passes, the, this distance will change as well as this distance will change not in the same way because the wave could pass in this direction in which case some changes may take place here. That will depend upon the nature of the wave. So, you will see the interference pattern here will no longer be dark, but there will be a change in the pattern as the wave passes. So, this is how it is detected. Okay. We will use our understanding of electromagnetism to learn about gravitational waves. Now, let me refresh your memory on gravity. This thing, these are properties of electromagnetic waves. Consider a plane electromagnetic wave of wavelength lambda traveling along the z axis. The electric field is given by the real part of, I write it in terms of the complex number, it is more convenient in many ways. And here is the electric field, E0 is the magnitude, and this is the wave part, the part which is moving, where k is 2 pi by lambda, omega is the angular frequency, is c times k. We are all familiar with. Now, E0 is normal to the direction of propagation. Remember in the previous slide, I had it propagate along the z axis. So, E0 will lie in the xy plane. The magnetic field B is normal to both the direction of propagation K and the electric field, and it has the same phase as the electric field. When the electric field is maximum, the ma magnetic field is also a maximum. And when the electric field is 0, the magnetic field is 0. So, the wave propagation looks something like this. If I have E in this direction and B in that direction, E cross B is in that direction. So, it moves like this. On the other hand, this thing comes here. When E is 0, B is 0. And when E becomes negative, B becomes negative. So, this is how the wave keeps moving, all right. That is the picture of an electromagnetic wave which you people should have. 
Now, the magnitude of B is E by C is here. This is also comes you people must have studied this I am sure. How are electromagnetic waves formed? We have I have already mentioned about uh, charges moving around an antenna, but I will make it little bit more specific. Consider a localized source in some around the origin in some small region of space. If it radiates, if this radiates energy which travels to infinity, consider a large sphere of radius r around that localized object. The energy density we all know is given by epsilon naught by 2 e squared plus 1 by 2 mu naught b squared. So, the energy flow per unit area is the energy density times c because if I take a unit area in one unit time all the things at a distance c will pass through that and here the total energy flow across the surface will be 4 pi r squared c e. Now, if electromagnetic radiation is taking place, this must be finite. Notice normally the, the, that would mean E must the energy density must go as 1 by r squared. Let me go back to the previous slide. Okay, no, it is not here. We all know E uh, for a Coulomb potential goes as 1 by r squared. So, this would normally go as 1 by r 4, but that will not do. We need E to go as this energy density to go as 1 by r squared. So, E must go as 1 by r. Similarly, B must go as 1 by r. This is necessary for the electromagnetic wave to travel. Now, consider a spherical dist distribution of charge rho r t around the origin. This spherical means I have not written a vector there, it is only the distance. Here is a spherical distribution. Now, if this oscillates, then the electric field at any point will be radial. If the electric field is radial, we know that there cannot be any propagation of electromagnetic field in that direction because for an electromagnetic wave, E has to be normal to the direction of propagation. So, I cannot have a radial propagation given a spherical distribution and just it oscillating back and forth. So, I must have some angular asymmetry for it to be able to radiate. Okay. Which can be taken the way simplest way to do it is take a point charge and let it move up and down. In an along an axis. Okay. Now, uh, I am making it oscillate along the z axis. Now, the wave will not travel along the z axis. Now, the wave will generally travel in some other direction. When the uh, now I will draw a picture here to indicate what can happen. Here is my charge. When it is here, at a point here, the electric field will be in that direction, which has some normal component. It is no longer completely radial because the charge has moved from the field. There is also one more effect and that is more subtle and you may not have been studied that and that is the following. I am looking at the electric field here at time t. That electric field is does not come from a charge located at time t. It comes from a time earlier than time t and if it if I call it t prime, it is t minus t prime equal to r by c. The signal which left here must reach here and the velocity of that signal is given by c and that is called the retarded time. If this is at time t and that occurs at time t prime which is equal to t minus if I call this vector r prime and if I call this r. that is t minus r prime. And then if you use the Maxwell's equation, you will indeed find the electric field has not only a component in this direction that one 
goes as 1 by r. Okay? That is a reasonably, uh, otherwise if I just think in terms of Coulomb field, it would have been just going as 1 by r squared and there would have been no 1 by r term. And that comes from the retarded time and calculating it from there. It is a little tricky calculation and it is done usually at the MSc level. But we will just assume that. Now, so the proper dipole moment of a charge distribution is given by P0 cos omega t. P0 is equal to QA. A is the amplitude. Now, I will assume the electric field produced is of the following form. P0 by R omega to the power alpha C to the power beta M cap is a direction perpendicular to the radial direction and cosine Kr minus omega t. Remember my expression for the dipole oscillates as P0 cos omega t. Now M dot R is 0. We can now calculate an alpha and beta purely from dimensional analysis. Okay? I will not do the calculation here. It is very straightforward and when you do that you get alpha equal to minus beta is equal to 2 giving the following expression for the electric field. It has this dependence. I am not worried about the theta. I am only worried about the r. This is some factor which can be calculated exactly in electrodynamics and this is the charge omega squared c squared by r squared. You can check that the dimensions are correct. It is very simple. This is q by r squared. Right? This is q by r squared. This is p 0 a and this has omega by c. Essentially, I get a lambda omega by c. So, I get lambda squared. So, this becomes r length cube. I have one length hiding in my dipole moment and that length cancels and I get my thing. And of course, I have the 4 pi epsilon 0 which always flows around. And B is given by E and has the right property for the electromagnetic. So now I can calculate the power radiate per unit time. I already know the formula for the energy density. It was epsilon 0 E squared by 2 plus 2 mu 0 by B squared and it is straightforward. Just plug it in and ultimately you get just the result. It is not uh, the algebra is absolutely straightforward. I, I Notice why do I get a C cube that also is clear. See I have a C squared. When I multiply E squared it becomes C fourth but I have to multiply by C to get the power which is per unit time and therefore I get a C cube and everything else follows. Oh I have also done one more thing. I have averaged over the time that cos squared theta factor has given half and I also have uh, the angular integration done for the exact what are the lessons we have learned from electromagnetic wave? We are almost through with the electromagnetic wave. Radial isotropic oscillations do not produce it. The de time dependent dipole can produce radiation. So, this is the lesson that we have learned from electromagnetic waves. All right. For gravitational waves, again, we need, just like charges moving, we need very massive objects which can give rise to time varying gravitational field. Black holes going around each other is a very good candidate. People have analyzed several possibilities. This is the best candidate. However, the dipole associated with massive objects like the previous case in a frame in which the center of mass is zero is, is at rest is zero. I will just show this in the next slide. Therefore, we have to go to the next one that time dependent quadrupole moment produces gravitation. So, this is where the difference of using an antenna and versus the uh, uh, situation in gravitation occurs. Now, let us give the proof. Proof is very straightforward. Consider two large masses M1 located at R1 and M2 located at R2 going around each other. So, this is the problem which you people must have solved n number of times from class 9 and here the center of mass is m1 r1 vector plus m2 r2 vector by m1 plus m2. But this notice is the dipole definition for mass. Remember what is the electric dipole definition. If there are 
two charges Q1 and Q2 at R1 and R2, you would write down Q1 R1 plus Q2 R2 is the expression that you would have written down. Here you are writing it as M1 R1 because Q1 is being replaced by the charge M1 R1 and similarly Q2 is being replaced by the charge M2. But this is nothing but the center of mass. So if the center of mass has to move, there must be some other external force which must be there. But when I am thinking in terms of black holes going around each other, there is, are no other external forces. So this is at rest or at uniform motion. So in any inertial frame, this is at rest. Therefore, there will be no act by the dipole moment coming from dipole moment radiation coming from the gravitation. There is no, none like that. So now I have to go to the central mass <coughs> does not accelerate. I have already stated that. Now let me go to quadrupole moment. Actually you people are familiar with quadrupole moment in terms of moment of inertia. When I write moment of inertia, it is m x squared or m y squared and that is now no longer with x. Dipole moment was with some q times x. Here it is squared, so it is uh, quadrupole moment. Quadrupole moment is given in terms of four numbers if we restrict our motion to two dimensions, say the xy plane. So I have here qxx is m1 x1 squared plus m2 x2 uh, squared and qyy is similarly with y here. Oh, this is a misprint and here qxy is x1 y1 plus x2 y2 which is the same as qy. So all these four numbers are there. And when they are going around each other, x1 will go as a1 cos omega t and y1 will go as a sin omega t and x2 will go as a2 cos omega t, y2 will go as a, uh, a2 sin omega t and they are just going around each other. Remember the quadrupole moment is square of this. So I will get cos squared omega t. That would mean that if the body is going around like that, my quadrupole moment will have cos squared which essentially gives me cos 2 omega. So the frequency with which we will see things will be of 2 omega, not omega. Omega is the physical rotation of the black hole, but the gravitational wave produced will have an uh, angular frequency of 2 omega. Again, we use dimensional analysis remembering that the gravitational field must be inversely proportional to the distance. Further, the charge is replaced by the Newtonian constant. Here it is. I write down the instead of the electric field now, I am writing here G and now I am writing quadrupole moment and R omega cube by C cube this. All these factors come purely from uh, dimensional analysis. Look at it. What is G? G is Gm by R squared. Let me just verify it for you. G, small g is Gm by R squared. And on the right hand side I have a G and M, Q0 is M times some length squared divided by 1 by T cube for omega cube. I have C cubed, L cubed by T cubed, L cubed and I have an R. So T cubed, T cubed cancels, I have R is L4 and so that cancels and everything matches. Okay. So this is dimensionally correct. Okay. And notice now it is 2 omega is how the gravitational field is. <coughs> Alpha, the numerical factor there I have not written can be calculated correctly in the general theory of relativity and that turns out to be 32 by 5. Now two black holes going around each other. This is a mathematics you people are very familiar with. Just take the gravitational attraction of each other and they go around. I am using circular orbits, so life is absolutely simple. There is no calculation which uh, uh, you people will not do very fast. And here, omega squared is given 
by this formula I will write down the, and the total energy which we all know is the gravitational energy plus the kinetic energy. So, I will keep the two formula here because that is something which I will keep using several times and I do not want to go back to those slides. as the two bodies emit gravitational radiation its energy will decrease. So, energy decrease means it will become more negative. If it becomes more negative omega has to increase that is the only way in which that can happen uh, leading to an increase in omega and of course, the relative distance between the two will decrease because omega increases relative distance decreases they spiral towards each other and merge into one and as they merge the frequency will go up. Now, we can calculate the remember now the strategy is very clear I have already calculated the amount of gravitational energy emitted I know what the total energy of the two black hole system is I know what will be I have to calculate only d e d t of this and once I calculate d I will equate it to the power loss and then everything just follows there is nothing more more than mathematics left. As the two bodies this is done so we can evaluate d e d t I just differentiate this expression here omega to the power of two thirds become omega to the power of minus one third and d omega d t is the other term that I get and this factor m 1 m 2 by 2 this remains here and 2 by 3 when I differentiate 2 will go away and I have left with 1 by 3. So, it is very straightforward expression. Now, this is what the astrophysicists do define something called m chirp which is m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 which is because these creeps occurring in the expression several times and they define it to have the dimensions of mass and put a 3 by and the observed frequency f now notice this is f is the not the angular frequency the physical frequency 2 pi f is equal to 2 omega or omega is equal to f by pi all right. Now, I can also calculate the quadrupole moment for two body system I can just write down m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared and substitute and you will get this this is the quadrupole moment of the two body system m 1 and m 2. So, I can substitute that here m chirp is equal to because I have I have the expression p I will also write that down perhaps I should have written that down earlier. Here it is I will also copy that down. There is also one more point.
I have to explain how I got this G, which I somehow uh, skipped. Let me just go over that. It's a, a just a minute. Notice here it is. For the energy in gravitational field, we use the analogy of electromagnetism epsilon zero e squared. Note G occurs in the numerator for the gravitational field, whereas epsilon zero occurs in the denominator. So instead of writing epsilon zero here for the gravitational field, I will write down my G below. That's where this G comes from. Once I write this G, this omega to the six and c to the five are just fixed from dimensional consideration. So this is the extra analogy that I use from electromagnetic field. And ultimately, I have written down the answer here. Now all I do is I differentiate this DEDT equated to that value. So after equating it, I come out with this form. Now this is very easy to integrate. I just take my dt on that side, df by f by left. So this will just become 8 by 3 and some factors here. And that's what I do in the next step. So I write it down, uh, integrating it from two times, t1 to t1 plus tau. And that is the expression that I get. As tau increases, this goes on increasing. And so this must, denominator must increase. That's the only way in which this difference can increase. This is fixed. T1 is fixed. So the denominator must go on increasing and it must go to very large values. Uh, and this continues till the two body merge. Two bodies merge. Now I am ready to do some numerical evaluation. So this is the experiment of the very first gravitational wave observed in the two observatories, one Hanford, the other Livingston, both in the United States. The thing to concentrate, okay, there are two or three points. This is how the gravitational wave changes here or there. Notice as it starts coming very close, after this, this is noise. This was noise, so this is where the gravitational wave exists and the frequency goes on decrease, increasing. It is the time, this is the time scale, the frequency goes on increasing, exactly what was seen. And notice the identical things have been seen. And here in this last one here, the frequency here is small and as it goes on increasing, it seems to go towards infinity around a time 0.43 and that is the signal here. Okay. And at say 0.35 is when it starts and it goes on up to point at 0.43, it is going to be. That's the same. So I will assume, notice here, at 0.43, the frequency, the, the frequency is around 40 or so, whereas that is around 200 and more than 250. So I will just assume the other one is small, and I write down f. This is very large, so I just get the formula written down here. Substitute that. Now we know f, this is 0.42 hertz and it diverges as 0.3, so tau is 0.8, 0 0.086. Seconds. This gives a chirp mass of 35 with alpha equal to 32 by 5. So this is how one determines the mass of that. And by the way, 35 times the solar mass. Now here, m total is m chirp divided by xi, where I write xi as the fraction of the total mass for m1 and 1 minus xi for that. So given this formula, notice this one can be 0 when xi is 0 or 1, or it had takes a maximum value of half. So that gives a lower bound for the total mass as something like 80 in of the solar mass. Now we evaluate the strain this, what, how, what is the order of magnitude of the strain? I have the gravitational wave at R0, which we have already seen, and it is given by this formula with a unit uh, vector. Notice G, 
Q due to the quarter pole moment, omega cubed is the frequency, R0 is the distance that is associated. Now, we already know the Q has the following thing. I can rewrite Q in this form and plug it in to the previous expression for Q. And that would give G is nothing but d squared x by dt squared and I substitute that and get this one. This is the acceleration that will be produced on any mass because of the gravitational field. As we know, this G is just uh, the acceleration due to the gravity due to the gravitational wave. It, in this expression, I have an eta which is given there. Now, I can integrate this and when I integrate this, notice it's there is a cos 2 omega. So, when I integrate, I will get a 2 omega in the denominator. So, that is what I have written down. This is the velocity of the mass of the mirror of the gravitational wave. Now, the, what is going to happen is when light in the interferometer is to going to go and come back, it will take a time 2 L by C or L by C and in that time, what is the distance this moves is the question. So, one of the mirror with respect to the other mirror will move because the delta x for the two will not be the same, they will be different. Okay. The gravitational wave are wavelengths are much larger than the length of the interferometer and so I write down delta L by L is delta x by t times the time that it takes and I substitute all this and get this number. So, this is the relation between strain and various quantities m total we have already more or less made an estimate omega is the frequency which can be seen from there and r0. Now, the question is how do you locate r0? and right substituting numbers relative strain and the distance of the source. If the distance of the black holes is 1 billion light year, the strain works out to be 10 to 2. So, how does one estimate an idea of the distances before? The, when the universe was formed at that time still it was all a big fluid, there were no uh, black holes or anything. And as it expanded, it took some time for the uh, matter to settle down and become galaxies and stars and so on and ultimately became black holes and other kind, kind of content system galaxies and in particular stars. Now, the farthest away are the ones which will have the largest volume 4 pi r squared is the surface area. So, the number of black holes that we will see will depend upon how far are the black holes formed. Because black hole merger, the probability of that will be high if the number of such black holes are there. So, it is a mixture of the two. Black, you should give time for black holes to form and yet it should not be too near us because the number of such black holes that you will see in a given volume, our surface will be only 4 pi r squared will be small. So, given that you can estimate and by the time black holes were formed, that is the best time for us to hope for the signals to come and that is we know the life of the universe is 10 billion years old and so it must be of the order of billion years for this to be formed and that gives us the factor of 10 to the minus 21. In fact, the experiment of course observes the screen and they know what the value is. Let me go back to that slide. Here it is. These are all strains at 10 to the minus 21 level and so given the strain they can find out what the distance of the black holes are. Now, I will discuss give a brief discussion of the noise. How can one be sure of such a small measurement? Most measurements, most important the observations have been carried in two different places for the detection and three for the subsequent ones. Therefore, if there was a noise in one of the observatories, it is not necessary the noise will be at the same time of the same kind. So, if you use appropriate filters, you will be able to reduce a noise enormously. That is one. But still, one must minimize noise and, uh, and accidental coincidences. 
I will list some of the noise, seismic noise. They are usually of low frequency and of the order of 100 hertz. The removal of uh, the, this noise is an engineering feat, but the physics of it is actually what you people are already familiar with. And let me say that. Supposing I have a mass, is, or let, let me say a platform, which, the, by the way, this is how seismic uh, things are recorded. I hang it, I hang a mass with a spring. And if the spring is very hard, it means it is, has a very, I mean, it's a rigid one. If this moves a distance x, that will also move a distance x. That's not what I want. I don't want this to move when this is moving. So when this, this thing is moving, if the spring is soft, it, this will move very much less. And you can do the algebra. The answer is, it is if the frequency of the outside one is omega, and the frequency of your spring is capital omega, then it will come out to be capital omega by small omega squared. So what these people have done, have put four such suspensions for the mirror. So if this is going, and the, at each level, the change is of the order of 10 to the minus 4. So by the time they go down, it is 10 to the minus 16. And they prevent this from coming here to one part 10 to the power of minus 5. And so that's how they reach the level of 10 to the power minus 21. That is the, the expression that is there. Okay. The next thing is that you, you cannot have yeah, the distance of the mirror is 4 kilometers. If you send a light beam and come, you cannot have that as air because if there is a small fluctuation in air, refractive index will change. So there will be change in phi and you have to handle that. And that is handled by keeping it in vacuum and the vacuum, you can calculate this and find out and that is a kind of vacuum level. That is required. Quantum noise, this is actually for many of us the most interesting noise and this gives what is called the standard quantum level. Now, we all have studied Heisenberg principle. That is, if I try to find a position of an object, then the momentum, appropriate momentum changes, given by the Heisenberg delta x, delta p of the order of h power. Now, here, when I have two mirrors, when I am doing an interference experiment, I am really check finding out the positions of these and using light. And the light beam, when it hits, is going to cause a radiation pressure. There's momentum in light. Mo light is kicking the mirror, so the mirror will move back and forth, and you have to worry about that. And secondly, the light beam which gives me light, the number of photons which reach also fluctuate, because it is not as if you get the same number of photons all the time. Such a noise is called short noise by the experts, so you have to handle what is called the radiation pressure noise and the short noise and they have different properties and one can do that by using certain other very interesting properties of quantum optics comes what are called squeezed lights and the thing what is done and I will not we will not be able to discuss that in any detail is absolutely a marvel and this is the actual state of the uh, apparatus that I have here is the laser beam going and here is the four kilometer. The reason it is kept as a fabric. The light beam is made to go several times here and here for reasons, again, to reduce the detecting signals. What you do is you also send in here through the other port here what is called a squeezed state. And that successfully removes many of the quantum effects associated with it. And the mathematics of it involves quantum field theory of quantum electrodynamics, which is a very fascinating thing. Ultimately, this is the way it has been tackled. All one knows when one reads about it, unfortunately, I've never had a chance to be at the places where these work goes on. One just is completely uh, uh, astounded by the physics and the engineering feat that these people have done over the last 50, 60 years. Remember, 10 years earlier, if anybody had been working, many of us would have advised him saying, you're wasting your time. And now the thing is in the center stage. Thank you.
So thank you, Professor Mani. Uh, uh, we can take a few questions. Um, I actually, actually uh, I had read one interesting story. I don't know how true it is. Uh, first, when the first detection was done, that time it was said that they looked at all possible noises, including possible lightning strikes in the in different places. And yes. so, is it, is that uh, that kind of weird also uh, important? For the no, it turned out that it was it worked out well because of the fact coincidences were different places where uh, they actually calculated the uh, chance of this and I forget the number it is something like uh, their sigma level was something like uh, 27 or something of confidence I, I don't remember the numbers but it was answered. Other questions? Yeah, Ankush. Uh, what uh, material do you use for detecting this? Material? I mean, how? Uh, no, I didn't any understand. Material can detect there is a, these mirrors are made of a certain kind of glass which requires uh, 90, I forget again, almost 100% reflectivity and it should have no, uh, it should be very strong, it should not bend because of the weight and so on. But are you asking for the quality of the mirror, the, na the nature of the mirror? I mean, you said you are. Uh, I didn't fully understand that you are trying to detect some waves and but there has to be some material whose movement you are trying to detect. No, there are massive, the mirrors, you remember I show, showed the um, Michelson interferometer. Right. The mirrors, because the gravity wave comes, the mirror distance changes to you, the detector. Right. Okay. When that happens, the light beam travels a different distance. Okay. Yeah, so your mirror is serving as a detector in a way, right? Yes. But all the entire thing, of course, is serving as a detector. When I okay, meant by detector, okay. I just okay, meant okay, the sorry. detecting the photon. Yeah. This whole thing is the detector. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. didn't okay. Next question. Yeah. Uh, sir, I didn't understand, like you said, like if we want to detect the. is a wave which is uh, the it is a wave of what is called the metric and the metric is what decides the distance between two of them just like you have an electric field which is passing there is the disturbance of the metric and that is what causes the change okay the gravitational wave consists of a metric which travels through and that metric essentially changes the distance between them No, the electromagnetic waves will change the electric fields. Yes. True. No, please say that again. Yes. No, no, not the, uh, that depends upon the kind of power they need and the kind of distances. That's the purely take. Uh, no. It, it will not, if I use shorter wavelength, it does not mean that things will be better. No. Shub. Sure. Uh, so, uh, I think that the uh, events which cause, actually cause gravitational waves that we can detect are very rare. Huh. So, if the gravitational wave, like the curvature is coming at an angle to these two. Pardon? Uh, like, I if it is coming at, say, 45 degrees, so they, it will cause right. the same contraction right. and expansion. So isn't, uh, doesn't it become very difficult to detect them if they come at an angle? The, that is why uh, right now they have done it in only two different places. If you see it in a third place, you will be able to locate exactly where that is coming from. So the, the no, all uh, the three places are separately aligned. Uh, so of course, they are aligned in their own ways. Okay, no, no, but then his worry is that if it comes at 45 degree angle, right, then uh, it will change the distance between the mirrors in the same way in the two arms. Yes, and then but you will not get any signal. Correct, but then 
the one in Livingston, supposing this happens, is actually on the curved right. It's on the surface of the Earth. It will see a different angle. So those things have not yet been really come. Right now, only signals of a certain nature have been analyzed. So the kind of disturbance is the next thing which people would like to study in detail. That just like in electromagnetic wave, there is a polarization of the electric field. Whether you have electric field along this direction or that direction, there are, again, you have to write down the polarization of the disturbance. Okay? And that has been done. It has been classified completely. And it's more complicated than the case of the electromagnetic. Gravitational waves can also be polarized. Yes, they are polarized in different ways. So in what Actually, way? because gravitation, I did not want to discuss that, because they are described by a tensor. So there are different notions. Like vector is all I need is one direction to talk about. Here, a tensor needs two directions. So how one would be just elongating like that, another one will be elongating in one direction, different from elongating in another direction, and so on. So these properties can be analyzed once more gravitational waves are detected. Yes. Sir, uh, no. previously, yeah, uh, previously mm. the, the LIGO had been built to in order to detect gravitational waves. Right. So now that gravitational waves have been detected already, so what is the next step that is being planned? The next step is just what he had asked about how are the, what are the properties of these gravitational waves. In particular, uh, one of the very interesting questions which people are asking is that where gravitational disturbances must have taken place at the birth of the universe, when huge bang happened, what kind of signals will that lead to? And we still have no, no such answers are known. And if such signals are observed, we may have a much better understanding of what happened before what is called the pre uh, era of inflation. That is something which is a very hot topic nowadays. Yeah. Uh, is the uh, change in length uh, detected huh. independent of the masses of the mirrors? Yes, yes they, that's it, they are independent. That's okay, so uh, probably that means that I mean the detection of the wave. Huh. I mean, if you move out in space, say a few light years away or several light years away, huh. you would detect the same uh, wave. No, uh, no. it'll be one over hour effect will be there, right? If yeah. the black holes were not at 1 billion, but 3 billion, my uh, answer would be the strain would be one third because my gravitational field will be one third. But as long as the distance is the same, it's uh, the right. direction does right. not, directionality right. does It will be the same. Yes, yes Malay. On passing of the gravitational waves, sir, uh, one of the arms is supposed to change in length while the other has to change less. Uh, yes, so that there is some, yes, right, sir. right. So won't the wavelength of the light that is going also change proportionally so that like it won't matter? No, it does not. No, wavelength change is not there. That, uh, that's the point. In gravitational waves, one can show that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I had just a little doubt that we talk about decoupling of light from matter. But uh, we talk about decoupling of light from matter right. in the early universe. So. Uh, can gravitational waves from before that time can also be observed theoretically? No, I didn't understand. The, uh, uh, what, what is asking is uh, for uh, uh, our uh, optical astronomy thing like that, uh, CMDR acts as, as a uh, opaque barrier. So yes. can we can we see gravitational waves from time before CMDR? Yeah, of course, because gravitational waves don't have don't face that barrier. See, in, if you have a lot of ionized matter, electromagnetic wave cannot travel through that because it will. Uh, excite atoms and so on, and it is block. I mean, uh, the mean free path is less, but not for gravitational wave. It's a very weak one. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Okay, this one, one sir, uh, to find the interference, to find the that uh, interference pattern, we first need to know the wavelength, right? Yeah. So how the wavelength of that light is one zero six four. No, the wavelength of but the gravitational wave will have some different like Pardon? But the gravitational wave which is coming, ah. it will, how do we know its properties? Like, pro it is coming from a very large distance. Correct. So, how do we know how to set up the distance? We don't know how to set it up because we don't know where the black holes are going to merge in the universe. So, we set it up in some general directions and keep reading it. There is no set pattern. Okay, yes. Do these waves face some sort of a um, 
effect of expansion of universe because uh, we are considering waves coming from no no this is really due to some very massive two particles coming together very near each other the expansion of the universe is a different story i meant the uh, red shift of gravitational waves no no this is that's a separate story that's not that's not the gravitational wave talking about here that you are talking about the red shift of the uh, hubble constant which is there no this is two things which are just merging with each other in a very short time the time as you saw was almost 0.1 second so the, the question is would would, uh, would the gravitational wave be affected uh, during the propagation no it is the whole thing is lasting 0.1 second so but that is the when it is created but it since it is like come come from such a large distance would that would that affect the no no for, uh, by, by the way z for this is known for these black holes it's something like 0.1 okay but that's where it is and that's where the merger took place and because of the merger there was a ripple in space time and that ripple is what you're seeing here but no, no. we do need to consider the z factor no we need don't have z factor is only another information by the way you cannot measure z directly to measure z you need optical signal so there is no optical signal here no uh, so i calculate the z factor by noting my r0 r0 is a billion light years so i know what that z factor is now i think his question Just is from the hubble the question is that for light i mean even though let's say in the same merger let's huh. say some light signal is emitted right now that light will suffer some uh, cosmological red shift correct when it comes here right. does the gravitational wave huh. emitted also ah. suffer some kind of such co cosmological redshift that's the question okay even if it in does, the in the propagation but yeah. that doesn't bother me as far as signals go it uh, originally there was one and there was some uh, change in the gravitational g mu nu that uh, as a function of time and that's what i measure and that function of time is for 0.1 second Whatever I am measuring is something now, see, a point one second, see that. which might have had a different uh, wave. That doesn't bother me. Yes. yes. How do you like from the gravitational waves? How do you distinguish from between the events that happened, like black hole, black hole merger, neutron stars merger? Huh. How do you know? Or even if it came uh, before CMB, that's how a, do you differentiate uh, between them? No, that is still uh, an active part of research, where the strength of these things for black neutron star neutron star is much smaller than for uh, black hole black hole so uh, the one which was observed was uh, worked out to be is thought to be a neutron star neutron star and the experts in that agree i do not know the details as okay. yeah, so yeah prashant so then pick up first so in uh, em waves we have two fields uh, e and b so in yes. gravitational waves one field is gravitation what is the other no uh, that um, is the point uh, the way they have just not been named there is okay supposing there is a gravitational wave going in this direction the, there is a tensor which has 10 components if i look at electromagnetic field it has six components three for electric field and three for magnetic field this is 10 components so they have been named only as g00 g01 and, and things like that nobody has named them as uh, different kinds so that's all so pratish we could have named so them e1 e2 e3 e6 or something like that in fact we do that when we do we call them f01 f02 and so on so is there a condition on the speed of the gravitational waves because the speed limit of light it exists ah. only for particles which move but gravitational wave is the expansion of space itself so no uh when you write the equation it works out to be the same C because C it C has C to C become C consistent C with newton's gravity and also special theory of relativity okay. you have to satisfy both okay so it works out that it travels with the velocity of light okay there's just one speed so let us all thank the speaker uh and uh, then now we have a tea break after we come back again at 11:30 for the second half of the function uh, so but before you go for tea let us all just go outside uh, at uh, outside the building in the lawn for a group photograph and then we will uh, have a tea break okay thank you